Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I would like to begin with a uh, disclaimer. I'm a fully bred condensed metaphysicist who understands very little uh, of the subjects um, that are discussed here at this meeting. Uh, but there is one point uh, where our interests and um, expertise meet, and uh, that is the physics of the zashtev yekit Hayev model, or SYK model, uh, which has created uh, quite some hype, um, both in the condensed meta community and, I understand, in the holography world, um, where it is considered as a quantum mechanical a zero plus one dimensional conformal boundary uh, of um, a two dimensional gravitational bulk. Now, I understand that it owes the status to a combination of two points. Uh, first, it has a, a very high degree of uh, symmetry in uh, infinite or nearly uh, realized infinite dimensional uh, conformal symmetry, which Maldacena calls NCFT1. Uh, and second, um, it displays hard quantum chaos um, at all uh, time scales. Yeah? And um, what I would like to do in this talk is kind of um, review, discuss um, the physics of this model from a condensed matterish perspective. And the motivation for doing that here is um, that in the last um, two or so years, we have actually made quite some progress in quantum um, chaos and, and quantum math in understanding the physics of correlations and chaos in this system, motivated by different uh, interests. And uh, this may be of interest because um, for you, because um, some of these results are actually quite strong and, and they may serve as benchmark tests, as criteria which a bulk, if it existed, better has to uh, satisfy if the correspondence is to work, right? So that's kind of the, the, the motivation. And uh, let me now introduce um, SYK. So in condensed metaphysics, we understand Zashtev uh, Yeki Taif is part of a larger family of models which we call random interaction models. These are just very simple models where you take is there a laser? Ah, yeah. Where well, you take a bunch of bosons and fermions, uh, let them interact um, via uh, interaction constants that, that are drawn from a static, typically a Gaussian uh, random distribution, right? Now, models of this type were pioneered in, in nuclear physics, actually, where they served as relatively refined models for um, chaos, quantum chaos in complex nuclei in the early 70s, then um, largely forgotten and rediscovered in the 90s, now in condensed metaphysics by uh, Zashtev and Ye, in the context of um, correlated uh, magnetic materials. Now, Zashtev was not aware of um, the earlier uh, developments in nuclear physics, but he discovered something very interesting, namely the presence of a conformal symmetry in these systems, which I'm going to review in a sec. And then came a third incarnation, now much later, 2015, by Kitaev, who proposed to take a look at the Majorana variant of these models. No, no bosons, families, but now Majorana is not a big deal. And um, uh, Kitaev's motivation from the very beginning was to consider this model as some kind of a holographic shadow. Yeah? And this is a model we are going to uh, address, Sashtev Ye Kitaev. And um, it is of interest to many communities uh, because it, it really shows, I mean, given that it is so simple, it shows a remarkably strong interplay of uh, correlation physics, symmetries, quantum chaos, and holography. And I want to discuss these except for holography in this talk, yeah? But, um, I mean, you, you can probably draw some conclusions uh, on your own. And um, the way I want to organize this discussion is um, that I first want to review or introduce the interplay of uh, strong correlations in the system and symmetry. And then I will um, discuss the ramifications or the consequences in actual dynamical behavior both in relatively short time dynamics, I will explain what is meant by short time, this is what you call scrambling physics and so on, but also very long times um, where we probe the discreteness of the many body level spectrum and see uh, quantum chaos in the traditional form, right? So this will be the longer part, I, I hope I get it, uh, make it to here. Okay, so um, uh, correlations and, and symmetry, here's a model again. Um, so look at it, uh, N fermions, everybody talks to everybody, very strong correlation, so the model is begging for a mean field uh, treatment, and this mean field analysis can be um, carried out in, in different ways. One is simply uh, to take a look at the two-point function, at the Majorana propagator, if you want, and expand it perturbatively just by brute force in correlations. The first contribution you get is of second order in interactions because you have Gaussian randomness, so you get something like a, such a bubble structure here where these here are bare Majorana propagators. And in the jargon of the field, this is known as a melon. This is a melon diagram. And now you push on and uh, discover more melons, right? There is, so there is a melon series, very similar to an RPA, but now uh, based on melons. 
And this can be self-consistently summed. So you, you write down such a series for the effective two-point function. And this um, kind of, uh, yeah, if you want beta psi beta or whatever equation can be analytically solved in, in, in a long, asymptotically in the long time limit. And what you get um, is this. So these are solutions for the green function and the self-energy based on this um, equation. And from a condensed metaphysics perspective, this is remarkable because we have here um, a strong non-analyticity, um, which tells us that this is not a Fermi liquid green function. So this is non-Fermi liquid phase. We are having this not a typical quasi-particle pole. And this is due to the strong, I mean, to the absence of even a second order term in the Hamiltonian. Yeah? Now, um, from my present perspective, what's more important here is now the aspect of symmetries. So I, um, there, there is the symmetry aspect, which I mentioned. And um, this goes as follows. Um, the system in the background, there's, there sits in Hamiltonian action of the system. I didn't write it down, but you can imagine. Yeah, I mean, just, just the action, which is technically a functional, um, that whose arguments are Grassmann fields, which in turn are technically um, just maps from the unit circle imaginary time um, into some Grassmann algebra, so the Majoranas, essentially. And the action is a functional. Now, what you can do is, just, I mean, for the sake of it, you can decide to reparameterize imaginary time. You, you, you just choose different time coordinates, which technically means that you consider diffeomorphisms from the imaginary time circle onto itself, one to one and smooth. So the, the set of these, there's infinitely many of them, and they, they form a diffeomorphism group of the unit circle. And it turns out that the action is invariant or approximately invariant under these maps. Yeah? So it's, there's an approximate invariance, but never mind. At lo long, long time scale, it gets fully exposed which means that this model, in, in, in strong contrast to a generic plain vanilla uh, quantum model, has an infinite dimensional symmetry group realized by the diffeomorphism group um, sitting there. Yeah? So um, this is what Milda Sena calls uh, NCFT1 symmetry. Um, now the important point is that the mean fields which we just discussed are not invariant. So there is a mean field solution which is strongly non-invariant if you apply a generic um, reparameterization here um, the mean field solution, which I just showed, changes in some way, independence on this reparameterization. So we have a classical spontaneous symmetry bro breaking dimension, spontaneous symmetry broken scenario in one dimension. Yeah? Uh, so that can be made a little bit more um, explicit by observing that the green function, here it is again, is invariant under only on, under a very small symmetry group, SL2R, so we have a huge Goldstone mode coset formed by the diffeomorphism group infinite dimensional minus three dimensions. Yeah? And um, that has consequences. I mean, uh, what, what it means that somewhere in the background we have now a, a huge, I mean, a stupid picture, but you understand there is a, is a huge Goldstone mode manifold sitting. And we are in one space dimension, I mean, or zero plus one, which means that we have to expect that the long time physics will be totally overshadowed or dominated by strong quantum fluctuations of these Goldstone modes. And that's an aspect which has in the, at least in the holography, in the early holography papers has been somewhat underestimated. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, broadly speaking, um, the consequence of what I said so far is to say that the quantum partition function of the model at long time scales will be governed by an integral over all Goldstone mode realizations on this infinite dimensional manifold over some effective action. Hmm? Now, um, this action can be identified. So there is this, like in a magnet, in a magnet you would have, have a Goldstone, I mean Ginsburg-Landau action of magnon fluctuation. So there's something similar here. You can identify the uh, Goldstone mode action in the sense that the quantum partition function assumes the form over all reparameterization realizations or reparameterization functions represented in some coordinates, I call them here phi, governed by an action. And this Goldstone mode action um, is written here and it happens to be equivalent to the action of a quantum mechanical point particle, namely, I mean, there is correspondence, it it's assumes the form of a, of, a, of a point particle action, a free particle in an exponential potential. And this is called Liouville quantum mechanics. And you know this probably from Liouville field theory. So this is a cartoon, one of Liouville quantum mechanics action. And that is a Goldstone action of this problem. And there are two things to notice. Number one, there is a, on dimensional grounds, there is a constant sitting here, which has a dimension of time, which is given by the number of particles measured in units of the high energy scale. And that is important because um, 
again, on dimensional grounds, you can tell that on time scales larger than this M, these Goldstone modes will go wild. They will be strongly fluctuating, and you can no longer do some kind of mean field or saddle point or God knows what approximation in this problem here. And the second point, which I'm just telling, is the Liouville quantum mechanics, which has been explored in different contexts before, is known for an astonishing degree of universality in the sense that you take any operator two-point function in this type of quantum mechanics, no matter which you want, and, and they always decay as t inverse three halves. That's a consequence of this exponential here, which means that this field has really zero dimension, technically. So these are two things which um, one has to know. And now we can ask what, what kind of consequences ensue yeah, from this picture. I mean, and um, uh, so now I want to turn to a discussion of um, ramifications of this type of mechanism, fluctuation mechanism, in the dynamics of the model. And what one has to understand or appreciate is that there are at least four different regimes in the dynamics of this quantum system which uh, need to be carefully distinguished. Yeah? There is a very short time physics um, where uh, what, what goes on here is what, what is usually known under the name of scrambling. Um, so uh, we will see that, we will see in a second we will observe quantum chaos. Then there is a larger time scale beyond which these Goldstone mode fluctuations become active, and we have to understand what goes on here. These are still, in a sense, I mean, this is quantum, but they are still short in the sense that these time scales are polynomial in N. Now, we can take a time machine and go into the distant future where we probe time scales exponential in N and hence inversely proportional to level spacing, many body level spacing scales. And that is where much of the quantum chaos discussion uh, takes place. I mean, and, and I, I come to that in a sec, but let me first um, review what's going on here. So, um, this um, uh, shortish time regime has been first. Um, ah, no, let me, let me first, before I get getting there, let, let me first introduce the observable in terms of which we, we probe this type of dynamics. And um, the master observable, which everybody considers in this field, is known as out of time correlation function, OTOS. They were introduced in the late 60s in Quantmat as a tool to diagnose the onset of quantum chaos in, in, in many body systems or disordered systems or whatever. And it goes like this you take any quantum system you want. You write down a thermal trace, and then you pick two non-commuting operators, again, pretty much up to you. And you consider this funny order of operator um, constellations under the trace. And the intuition behind this object is easy to understand. If we read um, the correlation function from left to right, if you read this from left to right, what is happening here is you prepare a thermal state, then you hit it with a small one-body operator x, preferably. And you create a tiny little perturbation. Then comes the operator y, and you let that one evolve. Yeah? So you generate some kind of time-evolved state here at this interface. Now you can consider the correlation function read from right to left. So now we have again a thermal state. y comes now first. You let it evolve, and only then hit with x at the, at the very end. And then you take the overlap of these two states. Now normally, you would expect if x is tiny, they're pretty much the same, and you get an order one overlap. But if there is chaos around, this here acts like a tiny butterfly, which flaps its wings and, and creates a massive perturbation in the time evolution. So you, you expect, if and only if you have chaos, you expect an exponential digression of um, fidelity in this matrix element. Yeah? That's why this is a good diagnostic for quantum chaos. Now, it was analyzed for the SYK in um, influential paper by uh, Malazena in, in, in 16. Um, and um, they used the di diagrammatic language, which I drew, introduced in the beginning. So they, they considered lots of melons and um, indeed found that the exponential digression, and there was a lot of excitement because um, the exponential factor which controls this is inverse temperature. And this is known as a chaos bound in the community. Um, if you have an inverse temperature decay here in a quantum system, you know that it is as chaotic as they possibly come. I mean, this is what, what people like, and I understand people also would like to see in black holes. Um, so that is one of the um, reasons why this model w w was, was considered so attractive. Yeah? So that's very uh, encouraging. Now let's explore what goes on uh, later in time. Um, you see that this here crashes into the ground at a time logarithmic in, in M. At which point, I mean, this should be positive, this function. Um, you, you have to work a little harder 
And uh, what you find then, again, in a mean fieldish kind of framework is that it trails out exponentially. So you have this very sensible behavior um, which you observe based on some kind of perturbation theory. But then, <clears throat> at a still larger time, there is this time scale m coming up, which I, beyond which the model goes quantum. And these Goldstone mode fluctuations kick in. Now, now, now you can guess, will it continue exponentially or not? And um, what turns out, I mean, somewhat surprisingly perhaps, is that actually it, it, it's, it ceases to be exponential. What happens out there for large times, and this is now a fact of strong quantum fluctuations, these Goldstone mode fluctuations I mentioned earlier, is that the exponential crosses over into a power law, and this simply signifies that quantum mechanics where chaos is concerned is a bit more mellow than classical. I mean, these exponential things are like Lyapunov exponents. This is more like somewhat softer quantum dynamics. T inverse 6, um, this, is, uh, this T inverse 6 is very universal and is a consequence of this inverse 3 half universality I mentioned in the beginning. Now, if you go to very low temperatures, temperatures so low that even initially you are below this uh, inverse time scale, yeah, you can do that, you just cool your system down, then there is no exponential behavior whatsoever. So the model is purely algebraic in its correlation functions. And I mean, like I said, I know nothing about by um, bulk boundary correspondence, but I think perhaps this behavior should somehow reflect in the bulk physics, um, whatever it is. Yeah? So that's um, one of the things I wanted to um, mention. How much time? Infinite? No, Quasi infinite. Eight. Eight. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so that was um, uh, came out of this um, this kind of analysis. Now let me say um, only <laughs> very few words um, uh, on what happens um, if we if if we really go to, to very long time scales where um, the approximations used here. And if you're interested, we can <laughs> I can tell you this to, in all level of details in private. Um, approximations used here just break down. So here we need to use different kind of machinery. Um, but let me briefly first tell you what's going on. So we zoom to now into the long time regime. Um, and there, I mean, the early insight we get, um, uh, we owe to numerical analysis. Yeah? So what people did is uh, they studied, um, N equals 36 is about the world record now. Um, they study spectral correlations. And I mean, people who have worked in quantum chaos recognize these correlations here as the usual suspects you use to diagnose quantum chaos. These are, for example, the probability to find neighboring levels, many body levels at a given distance. This is not really ultra long time physics. Yeah? These are level number fluctuations. How, how does the number of levels fluctuate in a given interval? And this is the Fourier transform of the spectral two point correlation functions. Um, this was actually a work by the late Polchinski and his group. And um, what these plots signify is that um, the model shows perfect agreement with the predictions of random matrix theory, random matrix theory being the benchmark model, the reference model for ultra hard quantum chaos. Yeah? So at, at long time scales, the model goes fully chaotic, fully ergodic, I should say, in the sense that here again, two of these correlation functions, you get agreement with the predictions of RMT, just Gaussian random distributed model Hamiltonians. This is a blue curve here is RMT, and here this kind of kink is again RMT. But you also observe um, that there are uh, systematic deviations, and they are in a way more interesting than the RMT limit itself. So you see here, for example, for n equals 22, you see systematic deviations from the RMT behavior, and there is, um, there is scaling in these deviations here. And the same here, um, the model at very, very long times, this is time, um, and notice that it's logarithmic, yeah. um, so becomes RMT, but then you have at shorter times, you have here this upturn, and obviously some scaling with, these are different values of n, the number of Majoranas. So the challenge is not so much, well, to understand that the model is eventually ergodic, but to understand the nature of these deviations here. And they are in a way more interesting than the long time limit itself, because they reflect the presence of some kind of relaxation modes in, in Fox space. So, I mean, some effective relax, irreversible relaxation modes which push the system eventually into the long time limit. And we would really like to understand what's going on with um, these modes and what their physics is. And the diagnostic tool to identify that is the two point correlation function, which is just the um, correlation function of the many body level density of states at slightly different energy. So once you know this beast here, independence on omega, you, you know essentially what's going on. Yep. 
And um, the analogy, I mean, the motivation for asking for these modes can actually be made on a much simpler system. I mean, consider, say, a stupid piece of disordered metal, yeah? Um, so in the long time limit, if you wait a year, it, it becomes fully ergodic due to the presence of disorder. But on shorter time scales, you have diffusion in the system. And diffusion modes and their quantum correlations of these diffusion modes eventually push the system into this long time limit. So we are asking, is there an analog of diffus diffusive relaxation dynamics in the Fox space of this model? And what, what can we say? Now, the metallic analogy is, is not so bad because in, in disordered metal physics, condensed matter physics, we know, of, we, we know tools that can be used to diagrammatic tools and field theoretical tools to um, represent spectral two-point functions. This is a function I just introduced as incoherent sums over uh, ergodic ultra long time sector RMT plus contributions from relaxation modes, which in this case are diffusive. You can see it here. This is a diffusion pole, pole yeah? I omega minus dq squared. And in this way, we, we just represent our correlation functions. And we ca you can ask, and we have asked, can we identify a similar type of structure in this SYK context? And the answer is, interestingly, is affirmative. So there ex exists an analog of diffusion modes in this <coughs> Fox space, where the role of this Q here, Q is in the, in the met metallic analogy, is the conserved momentum of a diffusive diffusion mode, the Fourier transform of the diffusion operator. In this case, and I, this I cannot explain, I'm just telling, and even that may be difficult to grasp, the role of this Q is taken over by all possible monomials of Majorana operators you can form. Yeah, I'm just telling you this is an effectively conserved label in the dynamics, and you will not understand it. I'm just throwing that at, at you. But um, once you know this, you can build a, a formula which is, and compute it actually, which is very similar in, in structure, and uh, now compare with numerics. And uh, so this is the um, original numerics, and this is um, what, what we get from this formula, and there is no parameter involved, so this is parameter-free comparison. And um, the, it's actually quite good. I mean, if you, if you sit down, it's order 8 or 5% deviations. Um, and the same for the Fourier transform of the correlation function, this spectral form factor in the field. This is here. This, um, Polszynski and Stanford and collaborator numerical data, and this is what comes from this formula. Here I should say, this is a bit, I mean, this is plotted with a loving eye. There are some deviations here, but they are non-universal, and probably you're not interested in that, but um, I, I still believe this is a very good uh, representation of this result. Yeah? So um, th these modes um, are for real, and that makes one very excited from a condensed matter perspective, because this is the only, and really the only quantmat system I know, or many-body system, where one can analytically uh, compute stuff like that. I, I don't know of a single other system, and it's owed to the simplicity of the Majorana algebra, the Clifford algebra, that's ultimately responsible. And that's pretty much it, I mean, um, yeah, uh, I, I wanted to... Um, share with you that there are these um, uh, conformal Goldstone modes around and that they are quite violent and are game changers in a way and they change the scrambling dynamics qualitatively. Um, on the other side, side of the spectrum we have identified some kind of relaxation modes which owe their existence to a totally different symmetry. I mean the keywords here are conformal symmetry and here replica breaking symmetry and I have no clue how these two talk to each other. I mean what, what goes on at intermediate times to just open question for me. Um, I mentioned this is really a role model or case study of chaotic relaxation in a nonlinear environment. Uh, and what this means in holography, I have no idea. I mean, it's just, just sitting there, so we, we really uh, cling to the boundary and do some boundary physics, yeah, on this one-dimensional boundary, try to understand it as good as we can, and that's it. I mean, but uh, if there are any um, consequences for bulk physics and so on, I, I just have no idea. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you.
right, in this model, I mean, to find a good basis. It was our holy grail, and we just couldn't. So um, getting, getting a linear in T behavior is actually, if you think about it, is it you, all you need in, is, is a uh, translational symmetry breaking in time structure in your field theory, then you integrate over collective coordinate and get linear in T. Yeah? So it's, but to actually justify that this is a good subtle point is a lot harder. And um, maybe they're right. Uh, it would be great to get it so simple, but I'm not sure at this point. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this new um, scaling behavior with the strong quantum fluctuations in this intermediate regime. And so aren't these suppressed in the large N limit somehow? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. T inverse 6. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, you are totally right. Um, yeah. I remember this time scale which we need is uh, linear in N, in the number of degrees of freedom. So if you push N first to infinity and then time to infinity, you never see it. That's what many people do. But if you keep N finite and then take t to infinity, it shows up. So it's, it's, it depends on what, what order of limits uh, one is interested in. in. In condensed matter, you typically have finite n, and uh, even in superconductivity applications, it's small n, but um, maybe here it's different. <laughs>